All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, for our next uh, session, we have uh, Olivier, and he is talking about uh, cloud native dependencies. Enjoy. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming to my presentation. So, my name is uh, Olivier. I'm working for SUSE on the Rancho side of the house, so all things related to Kubernetes. So, if there is one of those logo that interests you, feel free to reach out after. Um, you can reach me on the internet pretty easily. And otherwise, I used to maintain the Jenkins project. So, voila. But today I'm here to talk about another project. Um, in fact, that's a project that I started on the Jenkins project several years ago now. So the idea is to have like a declarative dependency management tool. So I wanted to have like flexible tool that I could use from my machine, from the CI environment, and where the behavior would be the same. Um, so and that's the thing that I'm going to talk today. So this presentation is split in two parts. Uh, the first one is I just cover what update CLI is. Um, and then the second part is how we use it in production since now several years, uh, what are the lessons um, we learned and, um, and the things that you could improve, uh, or at, at least I wish you would improve. So first, let's come back to the cloud native computing. Um, I was wondering what's the definition of cloud native computing, so I, I went to Wikipedia. And um, so basic, basically what it says is cloud native computing is an approach in software development using cloud computing to build and run, run scalable application in a modern dynamic environment such as public, private, and hybrid cloud. Those technologies such as container, microservices, serverless, function, cloud native processors, and immutable infrastructure deployed via declarative code are common elements of this architectural style. Um, cloud native focus on minimizing user uh, operation. So to me, it's more like, okay, we have like a huge amount of YAML file, we have a huge amount of containers, and it's pretty easy to be outdated in our projects. Um, when we think back then, we could just rely on operating system that would just handle the update for us, which is not really the case anymore. And so that's how um, I came to this problem. What used to work at some point stopped working, and so here we have three different examples of a Git repository that could run some um, job and then at some point failed working. Um, the first one is just Helm install traffic failed, not found. So we maintain, um, I mean, I'm maintaining a quite amount of, uh, of a Helm chart, and basically we had a dependency where the where version stop uh, disappear from the project. Um, we didn't notice that until someone raised an issue. The second example is we automate Goline uh, CI, so that's a small tool that we use in our Go project. And then at some point we noticed that there were version, um, so and then all the CI failed because the version was available, but the binary used for that version was just broken. So at some point the release process of that project failed, and we mean, I mean, and we were using the wrong version. And the third example is just me maintaining a bunch of websites and then realize that I'm using Hugo, I want to bump to the latest version, which by that time was a 0 0.88. Um, I did all the things, it was working on my machine, changed my configuration, uploaded to the Git repository, and then my website was done. Why? Because I was relying on a Docker image that was not published at that time because of some reason. And basically, what I wanted to... What I want to detect is in all those situations, I lost like maybe an afternoon trying to work and figure out what's work, I mean, what used to work and what stopped working at some point. So I was wondering, okay, how can I update things? How can I detect that um, I'm depending on a third project and I want to use that specific version? So the thing is, what do we want to automate? How would we automate that and why? And obviously, when we start automating things, we also want to know, okay, what would happen in six months, in one year? Does it make sense to spend all the time now to automating something that will just be thrown away next week? So the what? Um, well, that comes back to my cloud native definition. I'm maintaining quite a lot of file store on Git repositories. So for me, I used to think that Git is my source of truth. Um, that's quite simple. I can just run Git blame so we know who changed something. If I'm not happy with an application, I can just do a rollback. So by default, I will just look at the Git. The how, um, there are quite a lot of different opinions on using YAML. Um, 
I tried multiple DSL. I don't really care, care about the tool, the DSL in this case, but yeah, everybody uses YAML, so I was wondering why not. And then I realized that um, you have quite a lot of ecosystem around YAML, which means that uh, you can have like uh, auto completion, can have file validation. So I started using YAML. And why? Um, what we learn by automating updates is that first it reduces technical depth um, because we know when something needs to change. If we are confident that that thing can change at some point, we do it. And if we have some concern, we plan the update. So, for example, you think that, okay, you have, for those for people familiar with Kubernetes, you have like an Nginx ingress controller update. You know that it's a minor version, so you can just use it. If you are realized that there is a breaking change in the update, you just put everything on hold until you figure out what needs to be done. Um, it increases security, it increases your confidence on changing your system, and ultimately just by using the latest version bring you all those new feature bug fixes, and at the end of the time, it, lev it, it allows you to save a lot of time. So on the paper, it sounds like super sexy, and there are tools around there that allow us to automate those updates. The thing is, and that's where the real challenge is, we have a quite a lot of different files. You have, I would say, two kind of files, um, unstructured and structured. And what I mean by structure, for example, is for those familiar, I mean, who, is, um, who knows Maven, right, in the room? Okay, a few people. Uh, when you think about Maven, you have like a pom.xml and everything is very well explained. You know where to look for the dependencies and so on. And when you think about NPM, you have package.json. When you, ha when you think about Docker Compose, that's pretty much the same. You can just parse the file automatically and try to automate those updates. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have like raw CSV file, JSON, YAML, a huge amount of Tom YAML file. And it's really difficult to tell, to know in advance how you want to bump those versions. And in the middle of those, you have like Terraform, you have Docker file. So Docker file is an example where you have the from instruction where you can know what should be the next, I mean, the, the from instruction tells you the Docker image tag and the Docker image, and so you could guess what would be the next version. But within the Docker file, you also have the run instruction where you can run pretty much everything. You have the arg instruction and so on. So it can also be quite difficult, and sometimes those instructions are needed. So when we started working on update CLI, we were like, okay, we want to, to, we want to update. Uh, we think about the pipeline as we have a source, we have an information we want to, to, to retrieve. We want to run a bunch of conditions, and then we would expect the target to be in a specific state. So a typical example would be um, you're building an application, for example, a Golang application. You want to be sure that there is Docker image for that application, and only then you want to be sure that um, your infrastructure is using that specific version. So you can just describe in a manifest what you want to do. You run that command and then your file will be updated auto automatically. So in, that, in, in practice, what it looks like, it looks like this. So for, I mean, because of space, I just took two examples, sources and targets. So in the case of sources, you can have multiple sources like GitHub release, Docker image, YAML file. And for each source, you have a specification where we provide a really small amount of parameter. Though, for example, in the case of the GitHub release, it's uh, we want to specify the owner and the repository of the project and obviously token for the, for the, to interact with the GitHub API. And on the other side, we have a target, and on the target we say it's a target of type tomyaml. So we have a file named uh, netlify.tomyaml, we specify the key, and so by default, the value of the key should be the output of the source. And so then you can have multiple sources, multiple targets, and, and then, so if you run, um, um, if we run a DCLI based on this manifest, it will, for example, jump to the version 110 for you go. Um, which is nice because it works on my machine, but I want to go one step further is I don't want to change what I have locally because for that I know that information. What I want to be sure is we update the Git repository which is ultimately used by whatever tool, Argo, CD, Flux, uh, Ansible, Puppet. Um, so for the context, when we started working on, on update CLI, we needed to update both uh, Puppet Era data and Kubernetes clusters. So uh, that's how we started. And so here we want to specify the Git repository where we want to update the file. 
And we specify also the action. So the, 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 the action in this case, it's a Git pull request. So if something changed, we want to create a, a working branch, change the thing, push the thing, and then, for example, we could attach some labels. We can assign auto merge, for example. There are a bunch of parameters that we can do. And then we, we, def we define the manifest, and, and that's how it works. So starting from there, when I say, okay, we are bumping and updating version, it's not totally true because we're bumping and updating a lot of information. So in this case, that's another example where we use it to handle the release process. So we have four Git repositories, uh, the one on the left, top left, which is the APNO. So APNO is one of the projects that I'm working on. It's a, a platform as a service tool, uh, a bit like Heroku for Kubernetes. So we build the backend, we build the application, and when we we do a release that release event on GitHub Action sends three different release events, and those three different release events will trigger update CLI on the three other Git repositories. So on the APNO doc, we have a source, GitHub release, that gets the latest APNO version. We have two targets, one to update the file, so we update all the download links. Um, we update the website using Docusorus. On the Hemshot repository, um, we update the Hemshot basically for the APNO front end and the application and the back end. And on the Docker desktop extension, we update the Docker file. Um, we started using on a multiple other projects. Uh, so here are just a different um, example. For example, on Docker uh, ASCII doctor, uh, we used to bump Docker file, batch tests, and the readme. So. Before I leave the, the update CLI side, we had three, three topics we tried to improve. The, so the first one is declarative, which is the thing that I just showed you. Um, it works with multiple plugins. Um, then we have the auto discovery. Oh, sorry. And the idea of the auto discovery is we want to favor config, convention over configuration. So for example, if we know that we have the confar, a, a common update a scenario, we will just generate the manifest based on the concept, uh, based on the context, and um, and then we can apply them right away. And update monitor is the challenge where, at some point in your project, you know that you don't want to bump to a specific version because breaking change, but you still want to be aware of that. At some point, you will have to work on a specific upgrade. Um, I'll try to do a quick demo without putting my mic uh, here. So can you see my screen? Is it big enough for, for you in the back? So I will just show you, uh, this is the manifest. Um, in this case, this is the one for the Docker extension. So I will just run the command on the right side, update CLI. And while it's run, OK, it's already there. So internet is working, which is great. So the first thing is it loads one file or multiple file. For each file, it will download the Git repositories associated to those. Um, in this case, there is one source. So the source is defined on the left side. It's a GitHub release. So we found a version 1.6.1. We identify that there is a change log, which is useful to know if we want to proceed with this update or not. And then we have a bunch of conditions. So the condition on the left is the definition and on the right. So we are basically checking that um, we, what, we're gonna, uh, what we want to update is um, based, on, I mean, based on the information we have on the file, we are updating the right information. And finally, we have the targets. We have three different targets. So we have, in this case, those are just file, and we're just using a regular expression in this case, but they are quite a different approaches. And what uh, the manifest, the auto discovery looks like. So as you can see, we have the experimental flag. So right now, there are not a lot. Um, it's still, I'm still, I'm still learning on how to automate those updates, because most of the time, I don't know what I want to update. But we have the Docker Compose, Docker file. In this case, it identified that there is a Docker file that we could update. And so it generates the file. And if I want to apply it, I can just run. Um, yeah, there is just another command to execute. So I will not do more demo because I have to hold the mic. So it's not very convenient. Um, so before we go to the challenges that we face, so update CLI, we use it to really define what the update uh, scenario is. And so we try to adapt based on the situation. 
Um, on the what's coming, on the update CLI, we are currently thinking about having a V1. So if you have some opinion about thing missing, um, I'm open for feedback. Otherwise, we are planning to add more plugin as we go. Um, on the auto discovery, we are still in the process to better learn how to use that and how we want to automate updates and, uh, and for updates. Uh, voilà. So now when we think about the challenges um, around auto updating things, um, yeah, we, have, we basically have three constraints that we have to consider before doing any kind of automation. The first one is the tooling that we have access. So for the better, for the worse, um, we need to deal with. So sometimes it helps, sometimes it does not, but that's how it is. Another important element to consider is the environment in the way that we want to automate. So typically, do we want to um, uh, do we need human validation? Do we need validation from different time zones? Um, who should accept the change? And finally, we also have the human factor that we have to deal with because people do mistakes, and sometimes those mistakes force me to try to find some more workarounds. And so I'm jumping directly to the versioning challenges. So we have quite a lot of, when, we, when you look at projects out there for those who version their application, um, we have different uh, versioning strategies. So I'll start with the first one, the most, uh, most um, well known, and at the same time, the one that people often do mistakes is semantic versioning. So the semantic versioning is a contract between the project maintainer and the users. And so the idea is you have three main fields for the version. So the major means that if you bump the version, you are introducing a breaking change. Um, the minor version change means that you are adding a new feature, and the patch version change means that you are just uh, fixing something. The reason why that um, versioning strategy is super useful when it comes to automating updates is because just by looking at the version, we already have an idea of, OK, what should we do here? Should we put everything on hold until we have a better understanding? Or can we trust the maintainers that um, it won't break the system? Which is great. I mean, from an, an update point of view, it's really awesome. The bad thing here is first, people don't necessarily realize that by using this approach, they are sharing a message. So we often see people using this uh, versioning strategy, but they are introducing breaking change in a minor version or in a patch version. So there is really like a trust that you establish between the project and the user. And there are definitely, use, uh, uh, maintain, um, there are definitely projects out there that I just don't trust people because um, I got biked in the past. And then you also have like situation typically like, for example, the Alpine, Alpine. I mean, who's, who, who's familiar with uh, this Alpine version strategy of the current images? This one is super annoying because when you start using versioning, you have libraries that can allow you to retrieve uh, the version. And typically on the Docker ecosystem, you can see pretty much every kind of versioning. And the thing is, from a semantic point of view, this means it's a pre-release. So if at some point you have someone publishing a version 1.0.0, that version will be used. Um, will be used. Um, so for those who are interested about semantic versioning, Pay attention to really use it because it's widely used and and yeah people will just be that happy and there is maybe also one last uh, element that I find really frustrating is for those people who see the go dash one dot um, it's a pretty common um, thing behavior annoying behavior to see project putting the name of the project before the, that version. It has no meaning, and more importantly, it makes it impossible to use any libraries to parse those versions because there is, I mean, we don't know what the Go, for example, in this case is. The Kubernetes project does the same. Um, so yeah, just use semantic versioning if you want to, and I mean, it, it makes my life easier. So there is just one thing to keep in mind when we use semantic versioning is that the maintainer promised to the user that they don't break updates, but the maintainers don't know all the situation. So it just based on the test, it didn't break the, the uh, introduce any breaking change. So we should always pay attention to what we use. The next one is calendar versioning. Um, this one is also a very popular one. The main reason why people like to use calendar versioning is because they don't want to 
put any promise like the introducing version or not. So the only information you get when you see those version is you know that at some point you're jumping to a newer version, but it's up to the people, it's up to us to decide, do we trust, do we want to, to use that version? So we pretty much always need to look at the change log uh, before validating any changes. On the other side, what I find frustrating is there is no real standard about, um, so the idea of the calendar of versioning is to use your month date, I mean, to put a date information in the version, and there is no real standard there. So having a tool that could automatically parse the version is not really convenient, but um, lucky for me, I don't have to automate those kind of version often. Um, so yeah, the, the only thing you know is you're jumping to something newer. The third one, which is, I mean, I had a lot of hope in that one and I stopped using it, uh, which is hash versioning. So in the, the idea of the hash versioning is you, one, well, one of the problem, for example, is when you put version is they are not necessarily immutable. So for example, in the context of um, a Docker image tag, uh, someone can just publish the tag, another tag, and so you're using a different version. Uh, when you start using hash versioning, you, will, you know with great precision what you're talking about. So for example, that could be a commit hash, that could be a Docker image digest, that could be a file checksum. So you know that's what you're is using. When it comes to automatically update um, your files, it can be really tricky to know what's the real meaning of that, of that update. And, um, and so if you need human validation, we stop using that approach. Um, some projects start to introduce the idea where you can provide the version information. So for example, Docker Digest, I think can provide like 1.0.0 and then put the digest at the end. I saw similar behavior on the Rust project, um, but well. So yeah, when it comes to reviewing Ash versioning, it can be really tricky. And on the other side, you have all those confusing uh, versioning strategies. Uh, I worked a lot, I mean, I worked for five years on the Jenkins project, and one of the things I had to do when I look at the release process was look at the page that explained what the meaning was the meaning of the version. And it's definitely not something that I want to do for every project. So usually I would expect the version to be clear um, because well, I want to understand what's happening, and more importantly, sometime putting the wrong version can have be, can have like um, consequences for quite a long time. So an example was the Docker image tag. When I was writing some unit tests for the Docker image integration, I just pick a random image on Quay.io because I wanted to do some tests for Quay.io. Uh, I had a look to the user interface and at that time, the version that the user interface showed me for the latest version was like v3.26.0. And then I executed with update CLI with that version and it returned me the version like 9512289. And that version was published five years ago. And the reason why it gave me that version is because I was enforcing semantic versioning, and so it tried to be, to, to be smart and guess that it was a, just a huge um, major version, which is obviously not the case. It's not a calendar versioning, so I have no idea what the meaning of that version, but well, five years ago, five years later, I still have to, I'm, I'm still find this version quite confusing. Um, another approach to versioning that we saw a lot in the past, and luckily, lucky for us, we don't, is you using job ID in the version. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I mean, yeah, just put. Um, I can't m move on the, another topic before reminding people that latest is not always what you think. So in this case, I want to do a small game. So those are four different update CLI version. So the current latest version of update CLI is the 0 0.43.0. So I will just um, ask you, should all those manifests return the same value? Okay, who think all those four manifests? So maybe I will just review one by one. So the first one, we have um, a source of type Docker image, and we specify the image update CLI slash update CLI. The second one is we have Docker image, and we use the image ghr.io slash update CLI update CLI because of that project, I mean, because we push images to the two uh, registry. In the example three, we specify the version filter of type semver, and the same for uh, ghr.io. So I think um, the four should return the same value. Well, okay. And the truth is only one, I mean, there is one that do not return the same value. And the reason for that is because first, 
Docker image do not enforce semantic versioning, so we can put whatever we want. So that's the example that I just showed before. The second thing is depending on the registry, they don't sort the version in the same order. So for example, Docker uh, Hub sort the version by um, alphabetically, while GHR sort the version um, based on the publish time, which means that the list that you retrieve of tag is not the same in both situations. And this is typically one of the challenges I faced when I started working on update CLI. Uh, you would expect a version to be returned from, from an API, and the thing is, it's not the case. And it can be even worse where you think about projects that maintain multiple release lines in parallel, because then you depend, for example, did they release a version two or the version three in the past? Um, well, I mean, how they did they release the, the, the two different versions? So it can be really tricky to identify what's the latest version for a specific um, application. Um, another one that I also want to highlight is that because I've been in those discussions for a while is every artifact should have its own life cycle because I see multiple times in the past where uh, we want to use exactly the same version for the Hampshire, the Docker image, uh, the binary application, and then there is like one common change in one of the binary and then we have to change everything everywhere and it's a bit confusing. Um, another topic that I briefly already mentioned is the challenge about um, the data structure we want to automate. Uh, so those are just, um, I mean, who is using Helm here? Who is familiar with Helm? I mean, more people than who I usually face. Um, Helm has two types of file. You have the chart.yml, which is very well structured. You can like, I mean, you know what you have inside. And on the other side, you have the values.yml where you can put pretty, pretty much every kind of information. So automating the left part is quite easy. You just specify what you want to update. Um, the right side can be quite challenging. That being said, we have situation where we can enforce some good practices. So for those people, who knows uh, what the OCI label, so for example, who, know, who, who heard about the OCI labels that you can provide in Docker file? So this is just a good practice where you would explain how you would, I mean, what's the meaning of a label and what kind of information would, you would see there. So for example, that could be a way to, to provide uh, where the, the, what's the, the, the source of the, the Docker image, for example. And by using conventions such as those, we are all also talking about the same thing, which simplify automating those files. Um, another topic, and I don't really have an answer on this one, is more like, okay, how do you want to handle change in your project? Um, they are like the single approach, and there is the, uh, build up, the build approach. So for the single approach, the idea is quite simple. You have one change, you open a PR, you test that change, and then you move to the next one. Um, who is using Dependabot in the room? Okay, quite a few. One of the one of the frustration that we get. Uh, I, mean, it, I mean, the next question: is Who's using Dependabot with a JavaScript project? Okay, that's fun. So the, the challenge that you have with Dependabot is it find one update, open a PR, run the tests, and you may have like ten updates, fifteen updates, and if you merge one of those PR, you all want to uh, you want to rebase all the other PR, run the test once again and again and again and again, and it can be really time consuming about um, those changes. And most of the time for projects that, for example, use semantic versioning, most of the time the the, the risk is very minimal about the change. Um, and so you have the idea of having a bulk update. So for example, the renovate bot has this um, ability to just say, I want you to update all the version, all the dependencies that um, only change, for example, the patch version. So in that case, we could say, okay, for every patch version, just move forward, merge the, the, the PR, and I'm fine. And if there is a breaking change, please hold on, I want to run some tests. Um, but there are many situations where you want to um, you want to, to to change multiple things. Um, this one is one of those situations. For once again, it's an, uh, an update CLI example. Uh, we have a dependency, and we want to check. We want to update the Docker file. We want to update the test file, the batch file, and we also want to update the documentation. And that we want to do in one time. I mean, it doesn't make sense to to do three different PRs. And so that's one of the examples. Another example would be for those people, for example, uh, who use Golang. Uh, it doesn't make sense to update the Golang dependency, the major version, only, for example, in the CI or 
what you want to do is you want to bump the Go mode, you want to bump uh, the CI environment, you want to bump the requirement, you want to do everything at once. So you just review, test, and if it's fine, you move to the next step. Um, and there are quite a lot of situations like this. Uh, like this. Um, I don't have an answer right now. Um, so I'm still, I'm still learning on the way. As, as you can see, we, we wrote quite a lot of manifests. And so the purpose of the project is just to not have to write those manifests. But I'm not there yet. Another common challenge that we see when we need to change is how frequent we want to change those changes to happen. And so we have like, uh, we could apply those changes every second, minute, hour, day, week, month, year. What we saw is when we introduce or propose a change every second, people just ignore them because it's too noisy. And on the other side, when we propose changes like after a long period, people don't apply them because they are scared about changing. So we try to, to find the right balance between the two. Um, a typical example where we want to change as soon as possible is when we handle releases. We want to be sure that that release update is propagated everywhere. So an example was uh, when I used to work on the Jenkins project, each time we would release a new security version for the Jenkins project, we wanted to be sure that all our infrastructure was using that version. So as soon as the CV, the, the, the security version was published, uh, all infrastructure was updated in a very quickly, but otherwise for most of the time we don't have the capacity to update everything immediately. So we usually like to wait maybe every week or every two weeks uh, for those. Another, oh, another thing that I want to highlight here is the way we automate things. Um, I like to work with working branches. So when we are want to do a change, we create a temporary branch, we apply the change there, we upload that, we use like, um, like for example, so GitHub, you have a pull request. That triggers a CI environment, and if the CI is green, we ask two questions. Do we need human validation? Um, no, then we just merge and move forward. So typically, we use that for the website. Um, when we do a version update, when we update the JSON schema, I mean, there are many situations where we don't care about having human validation. And on the other side, when we have human validation, we, we, we wait for someone to look at those. Um, we pretty much never push directly to the main branch uh, because it sounds like a bit scary. So I have a question for you. Who wants to do that? just pushing directly to the main branch without any testing. OK, at least two people. Um, next topic that I want to briefly cover, because that's something that I find quite difficult, fr frustrating as well, is how to deal with the change log. Um, who's maintaining change log manually in the room? Who's automating change log? And all the other people don't have change logs. So we have no way to know if you're using and what changed between two versions. Uh, and the thing is, when you automate version, you want to know what's the latest version. But more importantly, you want to know what's the risk to bump to that version. Um, because for example, even if you use semantic versioning, nothing guarantees me that it will not break my project. So there are different approach to generate the, the change log. Um, Maintaining manually the change log is something that I would avoid unless it's really like a big project and you have like a lot of users and, and you want to really pay attention. But, but for example, even the Jenkins project, we automate, I would say, 90% of the change log. Um, the three different approaches you have the Git history. So you could, for example, enforce in the team uh, to use a convention named conventional commits. And the idea of the conventional commit is you provide specific information in the commit title which means that at the end of the release, for example, I mean, when you want to do a release, you can just use a tool that will generate the change log for you, um, which is super easy, as long as the team know how to use conventional commits. And the thing that I'm not a really big fan, but I know, I, have many, I know many people who like to use conventional commits. But the thing is, when you do the release and you realize that you did some mistakes in the, in the Git history, it's really hard to change uh, unless, you feel really, unless you feel confident about doing a Git push force on, on your Git repository, which I'm not. 
So there is one of these approach. The not another one is about using pod merge pull requests. Um, in that case, what you do is each time someone open a PR, for example, you attach specific labels. And when you do a release, um, there is some DAW tools that we just review at like, the list of PRs and suggest you the next version based on the PR since the previous release. Uh, one of them is Release Drafter, which I'm really use, a big fan on GitHub because, I mean, it's super easy to use. Uh, and just one file to drop on the project and job done. There is another project named Changey, which sounds super promising. And the idea of Changey is, if I understand correct, if I understood correctly, is it rely on files um, to detect. So when someone, for example, push a change, they provide a file to explain what the change is, and then Changey, based on those files, will detect how to generate the the change log. But what I want to say here is it's really important for people who use your application to have a change log as it helps to know what, um, what to use. Another topic that I often face when it comes to automation is what the source of truth of the project. Um, is it the Git repository? Is it a Git tag? Is it uh, a Docker hub? Um, so these are three different GitHub uh, updates that I manifest that we can use to achieve the same thing. And they all have specificities. Um, and that's one of the challenges I face is sometimes you really need to understand how the project is working. So on the first one on top left, the first one is just we use the Git tag. So we just say, OK, what's the latest Git tag for that specific Git repository uh, referenced by the SMID? In the second option, we have what's the latest version for GitHub release. Then you need to specify the owner, the repository, and the token, assuming that you have a token. The benefit of the second approach is that you have the changelog, because in GitHub releases, you have changelog. I mean, you don't necessarily know that information in advance, but depending on the API, we sometimes have more information. In the third case, uh, we are directly querying using um, the JSON approach. Uh, typically, people who use this approach is those people who don't have a GitHub account uh, and don't want to create a GitHub account just to automate and track one dependency. Um, and then we could have many other approach like Docker Hub and so on. Um, Usually, I try to use the closest one to the developer. So if the developer is part of the process for the developer is to push a tag, I will usually monitor the Git tag or the GitHub release. Or, um, but I usually try to avoid uh, artifact generated by the project because I often see issues there. That's pretty much it for my presentation. Um, any question? Sounds like that was clear, or at least I hope. And then uh, thank you very much. And if you have some updates story you want to share, feel free to reach out to me. And uh, voila.